Yeah, so yeah, welcome, Liu Jun. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to repeat that. Uh, okay, so uh, it's also a great pleasure to share with you the uh, a serious work I did during the past few years. I summarized uh, this serious work using this type of landscape of quantum phases and quantum materials. Here you see a nice painting uh, of landscape. Uh, it's actually not, I have to say, it's not easy to really see this uh, painting is from the Great Hall people in Beijing, in China. Uh, I, I was fortunate to have the chance to go into this place during the summer. Okay. Um, so, so uh, this uh, this talk will be based on these references done in collaboration with these wonderful collaborators. Uh, which I used to be a student at PI. Now he works to go to UBC as a postdoc, uh, if he can get a visa. And Meng is a professional mathematician and also a family, familiar, our familiar in China and Chong. Okay, let, let me start from basics. So uh, we know there are many, many types of phases and phase transitions will matter. For example, ice and water are two different phases. To go from one to the other, we have to go across a phase transition. And also, magnets at low temperature and at high temperatures are two different phases. They are separated by a phase transition. Um, those are classical matter. Um, this talk is about quantum matter. So, they are uh, microscopic matter in the quantum regime. For example, uh, these utensils contain iron, the wire is made of copper, and the blood pressure gauge uh, contains mercury. These are all microscopic systems because they are made of many, many atoms. And they are also in the quantum regime because they are forming temperatures of the order of 10,000 Kelvin, which are much larger than our room temperature. So even at our room te temperature, they are approximately in their zero temperature quantum ground states. And we'll have to use quantum physics to understand them. So these examples really tell us that quantum matter is not far away. Uh, just like classical matter, there can be many classical phases of matter. There can also be many quantum phases of matter for quantum matter. And quantum phases of matter have a vast landscape. For example, let's look at some of these uh, phase diagrams. Here, uh, this is a sort of a phase diagram of the fractional quantum core system. Uh, here, basically, each number represents one of the quantum phases. And you can see there are many, many such numbers. Uh, There may be a waste of height in this. Oh, not from here, away from the city. Yeah, they go to barn and like high building. Yeah, more. Yeah, high building. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and also on this side uh, is the first diagram of the high temperature superconductors. If we look at the zero temperature segment, uh, there are also many regimes that can be viewed as different quantum phases of matter. Uh, these are just, uh, we already see many types of quantum phases of matter from these two examples, but an even larger landscape of quantum phases of matter have been theoretically contemplated. So the general structure of, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. the general structure of the quantum phases of matter that we uh, more or less have understood so far can be roughly divided into gap and the gap is quantum phases. For the gap phases, we have um, mm -hmm. short energy entangled phases or okay. in the thank you. Or in the field theoretical language, uh, they can be described by invertible uh, topological field theories. And we also have non energy entangled phases. They are non invertible. Uh, I will not explain the uh, many of those. Uh, they're not too important here. And also we may have gapless quantum phases matter. Some of them may be described by conformal field theories. Some of them may be described by uh, scale invariant, but not uh, Lorentz invariant theories. And they can possibly also be not even scale invariant gapless theories. I want to mention on top of each of these categories, there can be additional spontaneous symmetry break. So basically this is uh, what we have understood of the a uh, landscape of all quantum phases of matter so far. But uh, this isn't, suppose, uh, suppose even if this, uh, each of these categories is understood, this is not the end of the story because we want to also understand 
uh, which quantum phases of matter can emerge in some particular quantum materia, this is what we call the emergibility problem. It's about the possibility of emergence. That's why it's called emergibility. So here I have some cartoon pictures of some materials. I want to ask by, um, say, applying pressure, applying strain, or uh, applying some kind of electromagnetic magnetic field, what kind of quantum phases of matter this quantum material can realize. Uh, as I will explain later, uh, each particular quantum material will actually have its own landscape of quantum phases. So if we just understand the quantum phases in general, uh, it's not enough. We still have to go one step further to understand the quantum phases of matter that can emerge in particular quantum materials. Essentially, uh, the key idea to understand this emergibility problem, which I will present later in this talk, is to use uh, this idea of anomaly matching to study the emergibility. Uh, if just to summarize, just to summarize this in one sentence, Suppose uh, this quantum material can realize, I want to check whether it can realize a quantum phase or a quantum phase transition. And later when I say quantum phase, I also include, I also assume it may be a phase transition point. Uh, to check this, uh, we can just uh, check whether this anomaly matching condition holds, where this omega and the capital omega are the anomalies of the material and of the phase. So condition you mean a gap with it may either transition, I mean, a gap is like with one relevant, one or more relevant position. By phase, I mean, the yeah, phase. The logical gap is I do, I do, I, yeah. Many of the examples will be gaps. I think the way to say is omega is the more like a UV theory on the latest, and the, 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 the lowercase omega, and the capital omega is the IR theory. Yeah. So, so yeah, what is the. Sorry? But what do you mean by quantum material? Do you mean a hamilton? I will explain. I will, uh, uh, the, short, the short answer is I don't need a hamilton. I mean a class of hamilton. You mean a class of hamilton. I'm sharing the same symmetry properties. But I mean, they were a real quantum material, they have to be called a hamilton in this class of hamilton. Uh, that's why this is useful. I do not need to know the hamilton. So in the previous literature, people also had various ways to check this, but um, the methods are kind of case by case and couldn't answer many questions. Later, I will show you some examples where uh, many uh, previously, uh, many questions that are hard previously now can be answered. So uh, this is the outline. I will first give you the general framework to study this landscape of quantum phases in quantum materials. I will start from the example of triangular, honeycomb, and Kagome lattices. And then I will um, summarize leading to this framework, um, namely anomalies of lattice systems, and then show you some applications. The applications are about gap uh, states and gap states. So, are you, are you going to comment if it's so really a necessity to have the anomaly patch? I will have that one. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, it's certainly a necessity to have the anomaly match, but it's sufficient to have the anomaly match. Okay. It's always possible. Okay, so let's look at, uh, to get started, let's look at these examples. I want to consider, now I want to consider three classes of four systems. Uh, spin one half system on triangular lattice, or honeycomb lattice, or cargo lattice. I do not specify my Hamiltonian, I, but I do demand any Hamiltonian I would have will satisfy those symmetries. So, but here by symmetry, I mean spin rotational symmetry and also the lattice symmetry of these lattices. It, so, I know it's a local Hamiltonian. So these are all my information of the Hamiltonian. I only know that. Uh, I'm, not assume, I'm not assuming I specify any further information of the Hamiltonian. Don't give formula, put the informal knowledge as not much as not true. In principle, there can, but for simplicity here, I'm talking about not even fermions, just the spins. Okay, just spins. Yeah. So it turns out all these three systems have the same symmetry group. Uh, there's SO3 spin rotational symmetry, and then there's this lattice symmetry. It has a name called P6. Uh, so to get some better understanding of what the symmetry group P6 is, uh, let me enumerate the generators of P6. It contains two translation symmetries. The angle between these two vectors is 120 degrees. And then there's this 
uh, six put rotational symmetry. So these are the generators of the P6 symmetry. In fact, these lattices also have some reflection symmetries, but uh, just if you simplify the presentation, I'm uh, including the reflection symmetry here, but they can all be treated. Uh, so uh, it may not be hard to verify that this is this lattices really have these symmetries. You see translation, translation, and a six for the rotation here, translation, translation, six for the rotation sentence here, and similarly here. So I can also visualize this by looking at the unit cell of this P6 uh, symmetry group. Uh, the unit cell can be taken as a hexagon. The center of the hexagon uh, is actually the set of the triangular lattice. And uh, this corner is the set of the honeycomb lattice. And uh, the middle of the edge is uh, the Kagome sets. The, these points actually all have names. They're called work of quotations. OK, so now we see that these systems all have the same symmetry group. And I want to ask, is there still some fundamental difference between these systems? If we, from the perspective of classical physics, we may think they have no fundamental difference anymore because they have the, at least the symmetry-wise, because they do have the same symmetry group. But what I want to explain here is that uh, they are still sharply distinct. Okay, that is, so I, I don't like, I mean, come as like two, two sides of the unit cell and Kagome has two sides. And on your plot, it looks like Kagome and the same number of points. You see, and this point is shared between one unit cell and another. So when you so divide by two, two okay. for, for Kagome divided by two, for Hanukkah divided by three. Okay, so I want to see whether there's any still some fundamental difference between these systems, although they have the same symmetry group. And uh, to see this, it turns out, uh, at least to me, the most uh, easy, the easiest way is to consider some fictitious box of these systems. Let me explain what box I'm considering. So uh, suppose this is a spin one half moment. It can be viewed as an endpoint of a of a Hodan chain. So suppose this is a Hodan chain, and at end point I have a spin one half moment. Now these are my lattice systems. Uh, let me just uh, remove the bounds. It's my it's the same system. I'm just uh, removing some uh, bounds. It's the same system. These are the spins. These dots are the spins. And now each dot can be. I will plug in this formula. Each dot can be viewed as the endpoint of the Hodan chain, and then uh, so I will. These systems can be viewed as the boundary of some um, box system that's in one higher dimension. And this box system is made of the Hodan chains such that the endpoints exactly uh, locate at the spins of my original system. So this is just another way of viewing the system. The box do not have to be physically existing. Uh, they can be some theoretical tool. They are some very useful theoretical tools to, for us to think about them. Is it one held anti for unit cell or one held anti for site? For site. Oh, okay. And maybe the cat missed it. Uh, it's okay. Oh, okay. That's happening. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's supposed to be some some Hawaiian chance, but, but maybe I missed it. So now the question is uh, what's the fundamental difference between these blocks? Uh, it turns out uh, this aspect is can be much easier to understand. Because uh, to understand this, let's first go one step back and prepare ourselves by thinking of a more familiar example. This is the example for uh, three plus one dimensional trivial and topological insulators. So these are all three plus one B systems. Uh, we know that their boundaries can be very different. But if I want to see their difference from the perspective of the bulk, um, we, know, we know from this paper that for trivial insulators, we can have a charge neutral mode if I if I try to couple my system to some electromagnetic field, uh, which is a U1 gauge field, I can consider the monopole configuration of the gauge field. And then I will see for the trivial, trivial insulator, the monopole will be charge neutral or more generally carry integer charges. But for topological insulator, uh, there's something for the weighting effect uh, also reproduced in this paper. Uh, the monopole in the topological insulator will carry half charge or more generally integer plus half charge. So we see the difference between these two types of insulators can be captured by the properties of their monopoles. One carries integer charge, the other carries integer plus half charge. 
this uh, whether there's this half charge is uh, sharply defined due to the time reversal symmetry. With time reversal symmetry, I cannot randomly shift this charge. That's also why I require time reversal symmetry for topological insulator to be well defined. Now I want to uh, play the same game for our system. Uh, previously, we see that those different blocks just differ by their positions of the Hordan chains. Now I want to uh, explain um, the positions of those Hordan chains really tell us some properties about the monopoles, but now this time the monopole is not the U1 monopole, but the SO3 monopole. Meaning the system has SO3 spin rotational symmetry. I can introduce some background SO3 gauge field and consider the contribution of SO3 monopole. Then it turns out if, if there's a Hordan chain here and I move an SO3 monopole around it, I will get some minus one Aharon bone phase factor. This can be derived by looking at the partition function of the Hordan chain. Now I will use this knowledge to do two exercises. Uh, so in the first exercise, I will apply uh, this sequence of operations to the monopole. So this is just the, the translation along one direction, translation along the other direction, inverse translation along the first direction, inverse translation along the second direction. After doing this, this monopole will encircle a unit cell. And if there is a Hordan chain in the unit cell, I would know, uh, that I will obtain some minus one phase factor here. What this means is that in this case, uh, if there is a Hordan chain in the unit cell, the monopole will carry projective or rational quantum number under the translation symmetry. Those two translation symmetries are supposed to commute. Now they do not commute uh, on the monopole. That's why the uh, quantum number is fractional. So uh, from this example, we see we can detect whether there is a Hordan chain by doing this uh, sequence of operations. As another exercise, let me try to apply uh, some C2 squared to the monopole. So here C2 is some 180 degree rotation in space. Uh, then uh, if I do this, I will also move the monopole around this um, C2 rotation center. Then if there's a Hordan chain at this C2 rotational center, I would know there will be a minus one, but C2 squared is supposed to be plus one, now it's minus one. It means the SO3 monopole carries some fractional quantum number under the C2 symmetry. So I can detect, I can detect whether there's a Hordan chain at some C2 rotation center by looking at the fractional quantum number of this monopole. When the monopole moves, creates an electric field, and that's what with the uh, minus one, I don't know what. I was just thinking of the partition function that starts with SO3. Yeah. And C1, U1, Chun class, what is Chun class in U1? This is SO3. Uh, but you have a Chun class on the bulk, the yes. kitchen bulk. So what's the term? W2, SO3, and C1, it goes in U1. Why U1? I don't know, because I'm just guessing. No, no, you want. I will say what you want me to say later. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's precisely one thing I will explain. Okay. And the, the three plus one term, I will explain that. Yeah, maybe you can. Okay. I, I was just thinking of like if I embed uh, the SO3 monopole as an SO2 monopole, the Dirac monopole, right? Then what the, the, when, when the monopole moves, Create an electric field along the uh, direction, and that's what the time interval of this electric field is actually defined. That's not how I think about it, but maybe it's a way. I prefer to not think about that because if I break the SO3 to U1, this connection is kind of done. So, you want to just compute the W2 SO3 integral over the Hamiltonian chain? Oh, okay, okay. okay. That's, that's all I mean. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it sounds I think that sounds right. No, no, no. I saw three. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Can I understand that it's a minus one sign because the model is kind of need you? Like in Instead of you want? It's a Z, Z, Z. Uh, You mean this one? Uh, no, 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 it's in the monopole. Oh, uh -huh. you made that saying days, but now you're saying minus one. Yeah, 
No, it's understanding because it's incompatible. Yeah, that tells us the fusion of SO3 is C2. Yeah, uh, but yeah, oh, I see. Any other questions? Uh, what exactly is the so this is a link invariant in four dimensions? What is that term? Uh, this is a link between W2 of the SO3 of four dimension. And with SO3 multiple, which is a line. Is a is a line or is it's not a line? In space time in, is in space time is a line, right? So what W2 SO3 link with with something which can put to a multiple invariant, multiple V2. Okay. Right. So what's what's so what's that what's the description of this SO3 multiple in terms of some the, the SO3 multiple where creates an SO3 gauge field. Where the integration of W2 of SO3 on the sphere is one. Okay. Is that is that gauge field U1 gauge field? SO3 gauge field. Okay. So what exactly is the term? I will show you the term later. Okay. Okay, I'll continue. Can can you tell the term? Um, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't count, right? W two S O three. W two S O three. This W two S O three that with some element in H of two P six comma Z two. Okay. Uh, which element I will tell you later. Okay. Okay. So uh, from these exercises, what we know is that uh, we we can uh. The different positions of the Hordean chains imply uh, the different pro properties of the monopoles, but those properties of the monopoles are symmetry protected. As long as the symmetries are preserved, I cannot arbitrarily tune it. So uh, they are sharply defined. Let's say these positions of Hordean chains or the positions of the spin one halves in my original systems are actually some sharply defined features. In other words, the three original systems, triangular lattice, honeycomb lattice, and Kagome lattice. Although they have the same symmetry group, they are still sharply distinct. So um, maybe let me now tell you for these uh, three systems, what is the monopole quantum number? I can uh, look at uh, the C2 squared for the two 180 rotation center, uh, for the 180 uh, degree rotation around the triangular site. If I have a triangular site, uh, if, I have, if I have a triangular lattice, then I know this is minus one because it will move around this uh, side. But uh, these three are actually the rotation are actually the 180 rotations around this point, this point, and that point. So they are the Kagome sides. If I rotate for, for triangle, triangular lattice model, if I rotate around these uh, centers, I will not see any whole chain. So I get plus one. And for others, you can similarly check uh, I will get one one for honeycomb lattice and a one minus one for Kagome lattice. Okay, so uh, let me summarize what we have just learned. Uh, what we have just learned is that although triangular lattice, honeycomb lattice, and Kagome lattice in one half systems have the same symmetry group, they are actually uh, fundamentally different systems, even from the perspective of symmetries. In particular, they have different uh, fictitious box that have different monopole properties. Those blocks are made of the Hornet chains because each Hornet chain is the so called uh, short range entangled state, or uh, it has a unique gap ground state uh, that preserves the symmetry. When I stack many of them together, the entire box is also some short range entangled state. Furthermore, the box has this SO3 plus P6 symmetry. Uh, in another language, uh, this is basically just the definition um, that uh, these different blocks are different distinct symmetry protected topological faces with this symmetry. Now here comes the important point. Uh, we know that uh, these blocks are different. Now the original systems are the boundary of this uh, box. Suppose I just specify the symmetry properties of the boundary, but now I, I try to change the harmony of the original system. Then I'm changing the boundary harmony. I'm not touching the block at all. I will still have the same block no matter how I change the boundary harmonic. Then 
if I want to consider any quantum phase that can emerge in the original system, the, all those quantum phases will be able to reflect some properties of the box. Because the box are just the same box, no matter how I turn the boundary continuous. Uh, and this is telling us the original system, because the box are different, this is telling us the original systems will have different landscapes of quantum phases no matter. This is the idea that we will be using later. And of course, here you see, so far, I, I'm just providing a very pictorial idea. Uh, and if you really want to turn it to something useful, we have to have a more um, mathematically formulated uh, theory for the constraints coming from mm -hmm. the box. And that's the next thing. I'll ask you a question. Yeah. So uh, on slide earlier, you have a table and you have a face. And did you show how you get this face? I, I thought I explained, right? So suppose I have a triangular lattice. The spins are just here, not at other points. Then I do C2 is the rotation around this point. I get a minus one. And this P1, C2 is the rotation around this point. But I don't have a spin here. I don't have a hot tension here. So I get a plus one. Or Kagome lattice, I don't have a hot tension here. So if I do a C2 squared, I get a plus one. But uh, for those three, meaning this, this, and that, I will get minus one because I do have a spin one half, one hot tension. Okay. What extent is C3 needed here? Uh, to what extent? Meaning, like, C3 is not. Oh, C3 is not important. <coughs> it's important in your, at least, the only calculation. It's not important for my take, for my purpose here because um, SO3, as Sal was pointing out, is some Z2 of Z2 type object. Two of them fusing together is not. Does it matter, like, what the total number is? I'm thinking of just more than maybe. There may be further constraints if it's on some finite size coils, uh, which I'm not exploring here. Okay. Oh, one more question. Okay. Uh, so are are you obvious? Meaning it's just gonna be a principle uh the top? No. Okay. Uh now uh, so what we have just seen is uh, from these examples of uh, triangular lattice, polygon lattice, and Kagome lattice spin one half systems, we see that some quantum systems, although they may have the same symmetry group, they are still fundamentally different in terms of symmetries. Now I want to uh, summarize this example into a more general framework based on quantum anomaly. So there, what is a quantum anomaly? There are multiple definitions, which are usually believed to be equivalent. For example, it can mean the obstruction to gauging some symmetry, or the obstruction to have some symmetric short energy entangled ground state, or the obstruction to have a tensor product field space with onset symmetry actions. Uh, but my favorite definition, which will also be used in this talk, will be the anomaly is just nothing but the manifestation of this fictitious bulk, and the bulk itself is characterized by the bulk partition function. Maybe let me unpack this. Uh, I, I guess we have already seen that uh, it's really the property of this bulk that's constraining what can happen on, in the original system. And what I'm saying here is simply that the box can be characterized by some partition functions. By the way, this is minor comment, but uh, I think you will consider the onset symmetry um, and also tensor product field with space. So that is the first and second bullet point they are this equivalent definition for anomaly, but for some cases, actually, sorry, I, I think the statement is for invertible symmetry. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, people are now discussing non-invertible symmetry. In, in, in that case, the first and second bullet point they have equivalent. Yeah, I have heard of that. Yeah. Um, so that but the second, second bullet point seems to be at least. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm restricting to invertible symmetries, yeah, but uh, I, I don't, uh, really follow the definition of the non invertible symmetries, but I think maybe you want to change the gauging procedure of the non invertible symmetry that can make them still equivalent. Yeah, maybe there are different ways of gauging yeah. symmetry, so yeah, the, but it's not your context. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so now I want to explain this, uh, these partition functions. So, what is a partition function? <laughs> Here, by partition function, in the standard language, it should really be called generating function of 
meaning it tells me how the system responds to some external perturbation. Here, the perturbation is regarded as the gauge field, external gauge fields. Uh, again, as I pointed out, I will be assuming this uh, crystal equivalence principle. So whenever I see any lattice symmetry, uh, let's just view them as um, internal symmetry. Uh, so uh, then from these uh, references, uh, there's actually a recipe for constructing such partition functions. Uh, so suppose my system, my box system is in, lives in some space-time manifold, let me first triangulate the space-time manifold. Then uh, I will have the sp space-time manifold will be made of many, many, uh, what I call hyper-triangle. So in 2D, the hyper-triangle is really a triangle. In 3D, it's a tetrahedron. In higher dimension, it's the generalizations of these two objects. Uh, then for each hyper triangle, I have some uh, contribution to the partition function, which is this omega. Uh, in order, okay, this is the contribution from each hyper triangle. And in order to obtain all the, uh, the total contribution, I have to add them up by multiplying these contributions together. In order for uh, this uh, total partition function to be invariant, under the change of how I triangulate the space time, uh, I require this omega satisfy some condition. Uh, this condition uh, turns out mathematically is just the same, and uh, they are the so called cohomology. But uh, for us, we can just view this as a symbol uh, that tells me that tells me how to classify different partition functions. Now I, uh, I should come back to Jonas' question. You uh, kept asking me what are the terms. Now I'm about to tell you what are the terms. Uh, so uh, the main message of this slide is that the bulk partition functions for a large class of lattice systems have been developed in this paper. So let's consider two, either one new 2D uh, lattice spin system. Say there's a there's a symmetry group that's GS times G internal, where GS can be any of the space group in one of the two dimensions. Uh, in fact, it can be generalized to higher dimensions, but there are just too many space groups in higher dimensions. Uh, which we so we didn't do it. So JS can be any uh, say 2D space group, and the G internal is some internal symmetry such as SO3 spin rotational symmetry, time reversal symmetry, or their combination, uh, but uh, and uh, some others. Suppose now when I define my class of quantum materials or class of Hamiltonians, I specify the symmetry group. I also specify uh, what kind of degree freedom I have. For example, whether I have spin one half or spin one, whether I have quantum stability spins or quantum cyclic spins, meaning I specify the representation of the degree freedom. And I also want to specify the positions of my degree freedom, meaning whether they are located at triangular size or honeycomb size or Kagami size. So these are the complete set of symmetry properties I will be specifying. The reason to specify these um, pieces of information is first, uh, they're really the fundamental information that one should specify before specifying any Hamiltonian. Two, uh, they are also robust information. Actually, uh, say if we have the symmetry group, then I can't really change spin one half to spin one. And also, if I have this lattice, if it's a triangular lattice, I can't really move the spins to Hamiltonian lattice without breaking the symmetry. So they are also robust information. So I will specify, uh, suppose I specify uh, these pieces of information of the system. And then uh, I ask, what is the bulk partition function or in Jupiter's language, what is the term? And the term is uh, here. So uh, the term can be written as a function that takes four group elements in my symmetry group to a U1 number. Uh, here, G1, G2, G3 are group elements of, uh, of my symmetry group. And I can write it as, uh, one part coming from the lattice symmetry and another part coming from the internal symmetry. The important uh, structure I want to point out here is that uh, this expression kind of factorizes into two pieces. There's this piece of lambda and this piece of eta. So uh, lambda only depends on the first two group elements, eta only depends on the last two elements. And in particular, you see lambda only depends on the lattice symmetry part. Eta only depends on the internal symmetry part. Uh, more precisely, this eta encodes the second piece of information. It tells me well, something like whether I have spin one half or chrome stable spin or chrome single spin. And this lambda encodes the type of lattice or the positions of the degree freedom, whether it's triangular lattice, Kagome lattice, or honeycomb lattice. Um, 
one important point here is that uh, this lambda, when I say it encodes the information of the type of lattice, this is really independent of what kind of G internal symmetry I'm choosing. For all the internal symmetry, triangular lattice is just a triangular lattice. I have the I have a, I have the same lambda here. Uh, if you accept that, then in order to figure out lambda for each type of lattice, I can just uh, go to a very sim the simplest case where the internal symmetry say is SO3. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, now let me tell you what is lambda for these three types of lattice. So, so where does that last statement come from? It comes from uh, it comes from two a few uh, facts. The first is uh, uh, any element in this uh, cohomology can have some mathematical decomposition, something like the Quinn's formula. Second, uh, I know I'm describing some question in SVT. And they can be constructed by they can all be constructed by real space constructions. And I can look at each of such uh what each of such element corresponds to. It corresponds to different ways of assembling those lower dimensional SPs into the entire SPT. Uh, clearly, it doesn't matter what kind of G internal I'm using here, I'm I'm assembling them in the same way. I'm just changing one SPT with this G internal symmetry. Another SP with a different symmetry. That's why they are the same. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so if I do Keenan's formula on this sports cohomology, there's a bunch of additional, it seems to me like there's a bunch of additional cohomology classes that aren't included in the way you break the function. Is that right? It is. Okay. And you're saying that, that those that's are, actually some non trivial thing. Yeah. You're saying you're saying those cannot occur in logic systems of the no, I, I'm saying they cannot, depending on what you mean by lattice system. If you mean by lattice system, you mean the system obtained by putting degrees freedom, point like degrees freedom at various positions, <laughs> then they cannot appear. How can you show something like that? Uh, it's in the paper. It's in one of the appendices. Okay. It involves some details. Uh, if you look at the decomposition, then you can really look at each, what each factor represents. Well, like yeah. Some physical argument for why they should. Yeah. Okay. Is it is the paper in the bottom? Yes. Okay. Appendix B, I suppose. And, and what 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 what? So when you have mirror symmetry, then there are some some. Well, I guess time reversal we already need to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's eight like four. Yes. <clears throat> okay, if there's no more question, uh, let me show you what is this lambda for triangular conical and Kagome lattice. So uh, again, just to simplify the discussion, I'm not including the reflection. The symmetry, the lattice symmetry I'm including is just this P6, it contains uh, translations and the six for the location symmetry. Now, uh, I mentioned this lambda is some element in this cohomology. Um, I, in this paper, you can you, you can even find the precise expression, one precise expression of the lambda. Uh, is it may be this long, uh, so uh, it's a bit complicated. But a much easier way to describe it is to use uh, here the alpha one, alpha two. So the reason why it's uh, difficult to describe the lambda partly comes from uh, this lambda actually has some freedom. Uh, it's known as the co-boundary freedom. When I, when I apply some of the so-called co-boundary transformation, lambda will change. But alpha one, the alpha two here, they do not change under the co-boundary transformation. Uh, that's why we call them topological invariance. So it turns out for this P6 uh, group, uh, as long as I specify these two values, alpha one, and alpha two, I completely specify elements in this uh, cohomology group. Then I just need to tell you what is uh, this alpha one and alpha two for these three types of lattices. I guess you can tell um, the way I draw down this expression is really, this thing should really mean whether there's a spin one half at the C2 rotation center. And this thing really means whether there's a, a spin one half at uh, the rotation center of T1 C2, which is the triangular lattice set. Then from here, we can also easily 
uh, see alpha one for triangular lattice is one and alpha two is zero, and we can obtain the others. This tells us the term that Jürgen was asking for. Are you okay? Because there is no separate thing for translation? There's no need for that. I see. It's okay. Once you know this, then translation is determined. Right. But yeah. C2, C2 is just a reflection. C2 is 180 rotation. Which is a reflection. Okay. No, no, no. Reflection. Oh. C2 is like this. Okay. Reflection. Uh, uh, also, for example, uh, suppose alpha 1 is 1 and alpha 2 is 0, you see each unit cell there is a spin 1 half. This is encoded. So, translation is encoded. We carefully check the orders. Okay, so let me summarize what we have learned so far. Uh, we have uh, seen that uh, different lattice systems have different quantum anomalies. And uh, those quantum anomalies can be um, just viewed as the manifestation of their prestigious box. And the box can be characterized by those partition functions. The partition functions for a large class of uh, experimentally relevant lattice systems have already been derived in this paper. And uh, this is useful because as we mentioned before, uh, all quantum phases that can emerge in these lattice systems should reflect the properties of the box. And in another language, this is just the same. Uh, they should match the anomaly. And this is what we will use uh, next to classify quantum phases in lattice systems. More precisely, the key idea is to uh, use anomaly matching. So suppose I want to uh, check whether quantum material can realize a quantum phase or phase transition. I want to check whether this anomaly matching condition holds. Here, little omega and the capital omega are the uh, anomalies of the material and of the low energy effective theory. So uh, it's known that in order for this to happen, in order for this to happen, this has to happen. But it's not really known that if this happens, uh, the work will necessarily happen. But uh, this is supported by multiple non trivial examples, and there's no counter example. We will take this conjecture as a working assumption and then go ahead. OK, any questions so far? I guess a quick question. Are you always going to assume that a quantum anomaly with quantum phase position involves only ordinary space phases? I'm not assuming that. Uh, it's just, I mean, this general philosophy doesn't assume that, but the examples I talk about are more of that type. Does, does omega contain emergent symmetries or only symmetries that are related? Well, which omega? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the big omega. <laughs> uh, here is just uh, the microscopic symmetries. Or maybe in your language, uh, you, you can first look at the emergent symmetry and figure out the symmetry of the emergent, uh, the anomaly of the emergent symmetry. And then you need to do a pullback that to obtain this capital omega. This capital omega is obtained already after the pullback. It's a dimension of well, then, two, I mean, there, it's cross possible, right, that like two, two low energy theories could have different emergent symmetries, but both have <laughs> the microscopic symmetry. Of course, this is well expected that for each material, in principle, can realize many, many different places. But like, then how can, like, I can just stack something else on top? Like, why is it obvious that that still can be realized? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, so now uh, we I have described this framework, and now I want to describe some applications, uh, some very cool applications. The first application is to the so called stable liquids. Uh, so what is a stable liquid? Um, before telling you what stable liquids are in general, let me first describe the two simplest stable liquids. Um, the first one has another name for the, for the theory of decomposing the critical point. So for example, it can describe a transition uh, on between an antiferon magnet and a valence bond solid on a square lattice spin one half system. And this, this is the simplest stable liquid. And the second the simplest stable liquid is supposed to be this uh, so-called U1 drugs liquid. Uh, 
in terms of uh, effective field theory, it can be viewed as four flavors of gapless direct fermions coupled to an emergent U1 H field E2 plus 1D. Uh, recently, there are some experimental uh, protests <laughs> which may which may have found this uh, U1 direct spin liquid. Okay, these are the two simplest stable liquids. Now let's look at general stable liquids. Uh, proposed in this paper. Uh, the motivation in this paper was initially really just to study those two simplest ones, and then we realized that there's a way to generalize them into an infinite family. So in general, the stable liquid uh, has an index which is an integer larger than four. For stable liquid with integer with index n, I will write it as SLN for short. So originally it's uh, described as a two plus one dimensional nonlinear sigma model with the Weiss Miller Witten term. The target space of the nonlinear sigma model is SON mod SO4. This space has a name called stable manifold. That's why we call them stable liquids. Um, it turns out the simplest stable liquid with n equal to five is the decomponent quantum criticality. This was more or less, more or less explained in the paper by uh, Central and Fisher many years ago. And in this paper, we realized uh, first uh, the U1 direct spin liquid can be viewed as the N, N equal to six uh, example of that. So these two cases are really quite interesting because these two theories can be used to describe quantum phase transitions or quantum physics beyond the land of inspector paradigm. But uh, they can still be described by some more or less familiar field theories. They're more or less familiar in the sense that they are gauge theories. The gauge theories can be viewed as not interacting at very high energies, but the gauge coupling uh, will become larger and larger if we go down in energy, and the theory becomes strongly impacting. For those, what's uh, quite strange or very interesting about stable liquids with a larger than six is that they seem to be some uh, theories that are uh, what we call non Lagrangian in the sense that they cannot be described by any weakly coupled field theoretical Lagrangian at any scale. So uh, they are so strongly impacting, uh, so that even at very high energy scale, either high or low energy scales, they are just so strongly impacting, unlike the gauge theory, which can be viewed as weakly impacting at high energy scale, but strongly impacting at low energy scales. So they have to really find the description, which is like the non model. Which is non generalizable. Oh. It's strongly impacting. Uh, unless someone asks me why I think they do have a Lagrangian description, I will continue. You know, someone asked that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I will I will use my um my backup slide. <laughs> so uh so why, why do we think the simple liquids with n larger than six uh do not have the standard um renormalizable large lagrangian description is because the simple liquids have some uh, strange symmetries. Uh, sorry. I think there are two things, right? Non Lagrangian description and renormalizable, non renormalizable, these are two different things. Yeah, I, I think different. You, can, you can also have a, like a, writing down like a highly relevant terms, but you can still call this. Yeah, but, 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 but if you want to understand the low energy physics, you don't need to add the relevant terms. Here I'm saying, you, to even just to understand the low energy physics, <clears> there's no way like what sure. you describe. So let me call one example. Like people discuss something called symmetry mass generations. So sometimes you will write a lot of the terms looks uh, highly irrelevant terms and multi fermion interactions. Yeah. But then those terms, I will still call this a description of some quantum field theory. So not wrong field theory description. Yeah, with the explicit cutoff, well, I think that's fine. But uh, if you want to send the cutoff to infinity, the carbons are also infinity. It's not that ideal. Also, in many of those cases, for example, if I just consider two or three plus one, the four fermion, the dark fermions coupled with, with some four fermion interactions, the four fermion interactions will be relevant. Uh, and it seems like uh, they are not renormalizable, but usually they have some other description which looks renormalizable by instead, by instead of reacting the four fermion interaction, we get some um, gross like or oh, Yukawa interaction. Yeah, but there is also terms even beyond four fermion interaction. You can say six body, eight body interactions to generate symmetry mass scale. Yeah, but and, you... and in that case, certainly is certainly beyond relevant marginal definitions, at least at the, the free theory description. Yes, but, yes. But it's still a Lagrangian 
field theory description. Uh, I, I don't call that background in field theory description. Okay. Uh, if, if you cannot convert it into a normalized Lagrangian, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure in your case whether they can or cannot be converted. Okay. Then maybe they can. I, I think in high energy literature, people call non Lagrangians even more than this. Probably not. not they, 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 they are meaning cover space meaning, but they have more meaning. And they also want, uh, they more or less want to understand more of the theory uh, by using tools like supersymmetry. Here, we don't have those tools because there's no supersymmetry here, and we cannot make those statements. But it's the minimal requirements, they say. Okay. Okay, the reason uh, we think that's the case is because uh, those stable liquids have some strange symmetries. Uh, so let me just make sure. So can you modify that statement or that claim to something like the uh, beyond Lagrangian field theory described by relevant or marginal deformations? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. But, but it could possibly be still can be written as some local fields of higher. Yeah, yeah, the Nanemia scale model is one of them. You will call this already beyond. No, no. Only if it cannot be converted into the normalized Lagrangian, I call it non Lagrangian. Uh -huh. And non linear scale model is which example? These are non linear scale no. models. Okay. Okay, fine. But for example, in 2 plus 1, if you use non linear scale models to describe, say, the O3 symmetry making transition, you can convert it into the Wilson equation, which is normalized. Okay. Then I don't put it non Lagrangian. So those stable liquids have some strange symmetries. For example, for stable liquid with index n, there's this SON plus SON minus 4 symmetry, and then there's a reflection symmetry. It turns out that this symmetry and this symmetry do not compute. But if we just use the usual recipe to write down any normalizable Lagrangian with Lorentz invariance, uh, we will see uh, the Lagrangian width has some commuting reflection and the flavor symmetries. And some flavor symmetries. This is telling us uh, this kind of symmetry is not a flavor symmetry. But usually, when in the, in the field theory, like when in the field theory, if you look at this kind of symmetry, you may think it is a flavor symmetry. Let's see. How, how do I know they do not commute? By looking at the non Because of the Yes. Let's see how this plays out for the two special cases. For the template case where n is equal to 5, then this SO1 minus 4 is SO5 minus 4 is SO1, which is nothing. So it doesn't impose any constraints. That's why for n equal to 5, we may possibly have a normalized Lagrangian description, which is say the NCCP1 Lagrangian. Uh, and for the second, this simply is the case where n equal to 6, this SO1 minus 4 is SO2. Uh, so what is this SO2 in this direct spin equation? It's really not a flavor symmetry. It comes from the magnetic flux conservation of the internal gauge field. So it comes from some rather non-trivial, rather non-trivial mechanism. It's not a flavor symmetry. Now for n larger than six, we have to generalize this mechanism to uh, non-abelian to the non-abelian case. Uh, there's no known way of doing that. That's uh, why we think they are actually beyond uh, those universal Lagrangians. But there are some caveats. For example, the first caveat, maybe we misunderstood the symmetry of the stable liquids. Maybe at no, at, at no energy scales, they become some uh, Lagrangian, renormalizable Lagrangian with a larger symmetry, but this is more, more or less ruled out by anomaly. Um, and there's another caveat that is maybe some uh, renormalizable Lagrangian with a smaller symmetry can become the stable liquid with a larger symmetry at, at no energies. This is hard to draw out, and we, we, we can't draw that out. So it's either really beyond those minimalizable Lagrangian or uh, is this situation. Either one is very interesting. Even if, it's the, even if it's this situation, then we have to understand how this symmetry can emerge. Uh, from that, we can also learn something very novel. So how does reflection act on the SOS minus 4 factor? <clears throat> Uh, uh, so, so the degrees of freedom of this theory can be represented by n times n minus four matrix. The reflection acts by the improper rotation. Either from left to right. So, strictly speaking, they do not compute for even n. Uh, for all the n, they do compute, but still, we couldn't find any number. 
Okay, now let me uh, go back to. Why do you say that? Hmm? It's the most of this reflection acting as a small. Why do you say that it's the most of reflection acting as a small? As a reflection. Reflection. <laughs> Special reflection acting as a flavor reflection. Why do you say that? That's it. That's it. That's all I just did. Right. Who's part? Spatial. You said the so called spatial reflection will have to act. Oh, you have, it must have some natural reaction in the flavor space. That's right. Yeah, that's, that can be seen by looking at the Western world. But, 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 but why can't we have a, a UV theory where that's the case? Uh, oh. Um, if we say if we write down those UV theories, say by writing down some either fermions with some flavors, covers with some object issues, we see there is a reflection that can be used with water. Yeah, I'm saying there's no reflection that can be used with the entire Okay, so uh, I will already mention. So can I make sure the statement you are making about this non lagrangian So you are trying to access some IR phase from some nonlinear signal model. And you are saying that suppose you went to some IR phase as some fixed point and gapless, is it? And you are asking whether this gapless fixed point can be accessed from some free theory or some Lagrangian theory fixed point by some relevant or marginal deformation. And if the answer is no, no, as far as you know, then you call no, 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 right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I already mentioned some of the symmetries of the uh, stable liquid. For index N, it has this symmetry. And uh, we actually also figured out uh, this anomaly. It takes this form. Uh, the Ws are the stable with classes. But uh, if you are unfamiliar with it, you can just view this as some kind of generalization between terms. This is the defined Three plus one dimension or two plus one. This is the partition function of the three plus one dimensional block. Uh, okay. Now now I want I, I would like to classify them. Um the more, more precise question is what are the distinct ways for a stable liquid to emerge in some large system that has a GUV symmetry? Uh, to be concrete, here I will take GUV to be either uh, this symmetry or that symmetry. So here, SO3, some spin, spin rotational symmetry. Time reversal, this CQT is time reversal symmetry. P6M is the symmetry of triangular lattice, Hollywood lattice, and the Kagome lattice. Uh, so this is different from the P6 symmetry I mentioned. The difference is now I'm really including the reflection symmetry. I, I, I can do that. And this P4M is the symmetry of square lattice or checkerboard lattice. Uh, Ruben this afternoon just told me the circular deep lattice also has this symmetry. I didn't know what people asked for us before. Okay, Leave. So, Leave. Mm -hmm. this is the uh, question. And the, the strategy to answer this question is to look for a symmetry embedding pattern that embeds my microscopic symmetry into the emergent symmetry of my uh, stable liquid. And this symmetry embedding pattern mathematically is a group homomorphism. And I want this uh, symmetry embedding pattern to make this anomaly matching condition holds. So this is the anomaly matching condition. This phi star of capital omega IR is, so this capital omega IR means the anomaly that I showed you in the previous page is the anomaly associated with the full emergent symmetry. And this phi star is essentially telling me what this omega IR becomes if I restrict this uh, GIR into the subgroup in which G V is embedded into. So after this restriction, they should be the same. If I can find such a phi symmetry embedding pattern, then it represents um, a way to realize this stable liquid. There are some remarks. Um, as far as I know, for those non lagrangian theories, uh, this is the only method to classify them. And, and uh, because their gap is when they are realized, we would like to ask about their stability. But the stability is really uh, determined by the GUV symmetrical perturbations. So GUV is the microscopic symmetry. 
And we need to know the scaling dimensions of those uh, two UV symmetrical perturbations. If they are all irrelevant, then it's stable. If I have one relevant perturbation, it's a critical point. If we have more, it's a multi-critical point. But uh, at the moment, the scaling dimensions of most of these are not really known. So uh, the stability statements um, will depend on some assumptions about the, about the previous literature of the scaling dimensions. Also, this symmetry invalid pattern includes some observable signatures. Let me show you the results. So using this very general uh, systematic framework, we can find out all possible ways to realize the stable equation. To be concrete, let's just consider uh, the index and it being five, six, and seven. Uh, here I'm summarizing the number of stable realizations on various lattices, uh, but the, but uh, the more complete results can be found in this paper. Mm. And also here, I'm just looking at these lattices. There are lots of other types of lattices they are all considered. And we can compare them with the previous literature. We see that we can not only reproduce all the previous known realizations of the decompound quantum criticality and the direct spin liquid, we can also uncover many previous unknown ones. And for the non-Lagrangian, the simplest non-Lagrangian one with n equal to seven, we also will find many realizations. So that, so on the latter system, what is the actual computation? What is the computation that you do? Uh, I know this expression. Yeah. I know this expression. I look for a group homomorphism. In this context, in, in physics, sir. What, what are you doing? You, you do some reflections and spin rotation, what you have mastered, or what could actually do? Uh, <laughs> I'm really doing this. So, this is. Uh, this is an element in some cohomology group. Okay. This is another element in the cohomology group. There's a map, and I apply the map, and I check whether they are the same. Okay. Uh, that's by the way, how to do this symmetry and that's if I have yeah, no. this big group. And once it has that, then it's just some mathematical. It's just, there's no, no, the rest is kind of done. Okay. The, you know, it's like it is somehow equivalent to computing, say, a very favorable model. I just want, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, uh, I don't think they're in a much more sophisticated way. I, I don't think they are equivalent because uh, uh, for the simplest case, uh, finding the benefits of the monopoly is more like just a, in some sense, they are equivalent. Okay, now you put in this. In some sense, they're more they're <laughs> <laughs> Is it just finding the variant maybe like finding what the blanket is? It's really finding, it's, it's really giving an omega, finding a phi. In some sense, it's giving omega, giving capital omega, finding phi. It's a purely algebraic computation of certain symmetries of the, of the system. Yes, and yes. Right, and uh, um, a lot of details, maybe the full details are given in the paper. There are also some mathematical codes uploaded on our academy. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let me, show you <laughs> let me show you some examples. Let me show you some examples. So let's first look at this input the seven stable liquid. I want to highlight two particular uh, realizations we found. One is on the carbon lattice one half, the other is on triangular lattice one half. The reason I want to highlight these two examples is because uh, from the symmetry invalid pattern, I'm able to figure out the symmetry breaking pattern of these nearby adjacent phases. For those two, the precise symmetry breaking patterns were previously reported in some numerical works, these numerical works. Then this is some useful information towards lab realization of or numerical realization of this state because we can just start from these symmetry breaking phases and explore their vicinity in the phase diagram, and maybe we can end up with a more interesting stable liquid, which whose signature, can, for example, includes those emergent symmetry, which can, in principle, be evolved by Newton. Ah. So, so if you go to this magnetic symmetry breaking phase, I mean, is it described by this S of seven process of three nonlinear sigma model? I think so. But in the weekly okay. couple, can you? I mean, can you derive it from the? I mean, that's how. That's kind of how we develop. 
from the same issue to binding pattern, I can ask if the <laughs> nonlinear signal model fields acquire some expectation value, what is the remaining signature? That's how we determine this. No, but whether the, like if you start with the spin model, whether the one from the summing up of the verifiers or the can you do that? No, uh, we, we can't do it that way. So basically, the philosophy I'm trying to convey here is uh, we, we don't do those macroscopic things. They are they require a lot of power, and we here just the brand imagine. That's a good idea. You mean the microscopic calculation? Yeah, that's that is. And so when you're drawing this, are you applying that? Do you know it's stable, that it's extended space, or do you know what which fine tuning is? Yeah, under some assumptions of the screen dimensions, we think it's stable. Uh, the assumptions are coming from some uh, experience of some analogous theories, but they are assumptions. Not so far. Even those places have not been found. I'm not sure if those spaces have found new materials, but they have found new numerical studies. But by the way, this is, uh, 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 I'm saying this is not a translation, it's a phrase. That's fine, I just want to know if the boundary is The These have been observed in numerical. Uh, what, what, what would drive the transition from the negative or the Some parameter? Oh, we don't know the hamfanya, so we don't know the precise ham. Uh, okay. What's the symmetry breaking pattern? Is it as a yeah? Uh, you can read off. You can read off the symmetry. The many symmetry of that, then you know the symmetry breaking pattern. But by looking at this figure, you can read off the the many symmetry. It's it's not easy, but you can so you can. It's in the paper. Okay. Uh, so the previous example may give you the impression that uh, this method, this framework of anomaly matching is only useful for those very weird, very strange non-Lagrangian theories. But now I want to explain, they're also useful and we perhaps necessary if we just want to study some more familiar theories. In fact, I will show you some examples of previously unknown results about the previously studied theories. The first is I mentioned that this theory of the found a quantum critical point, uh, this theory, this particular theory, can be used to describe the transition between these two phases, this pair of phases. Now I ask, <clears throat> say, on the square lattice spin one half system with the same symmetry group, whether this same theory can be used to describe another pair of transitions, say, um, maybe not antiferromagnet, but say ferromagnet and some balance bond solid, is that possible? And the symmetry breaking any other pairs of symmetry breaking phases, yeah. Okay, you the Yes. Uh, then, uh, from our uh, classification, we can see that um, this particular theory actually has a unique way to be realized on square lattice spin one half system. Uh, when it's realized, uh, the nearby symmetry breaking phases, one of them has to be antiferromagnet, and the other has to be valence bond solid. And uh, there's no other um, possibility. I think this is interesting because there's only one way and people found it many years ago. But we can look at how common that is in half system. Um, already many years ago, people knew that uh, this theory, in principle, can be able to describe the transition between antiferromagnet magnet and this so-called calculated valence bond solid. And what we found is that it can also be used to describe the transition between this staggered valence bond solid and it's a quotation mark for a magnet. You, you have a question? Oh. Quotation mark for a magnet? What's the quotation mark? Quotation mark means uh, this is uh, not the usual for magnet in the sense that uh, the order parameter is not a spin. The order parameter is the vector spin canality. The symmetry, the remaining symmetry group is the same as the for a magnet, but it's a very different order parameter. So, so the dose for modes there have been in the first? Yeah. There were a few of them. Yeah, this is uh, another example of previous unknown results. And also the next example, people studied the Dirac spin liquids and they they, they studied it on square on square lattice and Honeycomb lattice. 
So previously, people thought there's no stable realization for uh, direct spin liquid on these two lattices, but we found multiple. Uh, one thing uh, I, I may not explain, but one thing one can deduce from this is that uh, these states are beyond the usual uh, SU2 fermion pattern construction. The more precise statement is, real, is really saying those states cannot be obtained from SU2 gauge theory coupled to two flavors of the fermions by Higgs. U1, U1. This is U1. But in the previous studies of this, in, the, in, the, in this study and this study, the U1 gauge theory can be obtained from the SU2 gauge theory by Higgs. Oh, you're in the five quadrant. Yeah. I'm saying for those ones, they cannot be obtained in that. Okay, the next example. So the direct spin liquid has a, it has this very nice Lagrangian. So people may think it can always be realized through some pattern in field construction, um, but it may not be the case. For example, we can ask, here we have four flavors of direct fermions. We can ask how do they transform under the SO3 symmetry? In the previous literature, people basically always take them to transform, take the four of them to transform as two different spin one half representations. Each spin one half contains two drug fermions, and two of them together is four. What we found is that they can also transform as a single spin three half representation. Spin three half contains four components. Then it turns out uh, there's some fermion doubling theorem that forbids any part of midfield construction of this state. So, how do you get like a spin operator? Uh, the spin operator in this case is pretty complicated. The monopole operator, the, in the direct spin liquid, the monopole operator uh, is related to the spin pneumatic water frame. And then we have to fuse a few monopole operators to obtain the spin operator. Okay. And the bilinear, that's, that's what we're interested in. From your bilinear, uh, from your bilinear, some of them may be related to spin bilinear. Okay, then uh, a few weeks ago, there's this experiment uh, about this material uh, with such neutron scattering data. The suggestion from the paper is that this is some direct spin liquid, but uh, with strong signals of neutron in, at these positions of the Boolean zone. Uh, from our analysis, we can see where which are the possible moment of those strong signals. Uh, they don't match any of those. So there's some incompatibility with the anomaly, meaning this suggestion. Then a puzzle is uh, what's really realized in this material. So you mean if I do the U1 direction, we can get a strong signal there? Yeah. I get to the simple part on the two theories. Yeah, you you either do the same one or you do or you consider what it all cases that we consider, uh, none of them matches this. One possi one, one boolean possibility is that this material just breaks the last symmetry. So the unit cells are enlarged and boolean zones are folded. Maybe those points are all at the gamma point. Then it's okay. Okay, I don't know. This is the Berkeley group and uh you know more on, on this paper No, this is the Chinese group. So most papers in May, this is just a, a few weeks back. Well, so they also gave no more. That's okay? That's compatible. The this is a, the triangular lattice. This is a carbon lattice. Okay. okay, so these are the applications of uh, gap states. Now that we also use the last 10 minutes to apply to the gap states. So to apply to gap spin liquids, um, gap to spin liquids are essentially gap to spin systems with emergent anions. For example, we have we can look at this uh, solar ball hypotenuse of the code. It's on the square lattice. Uh, it's hypotenuse written this way. And for this hypotenuse, we can solve it. And we can find that there are four types of excitations, uh, usually called one E and epsilon. They have such fusion rules. If I put two E's together, it's the same as uh, this one. Also, there's some interesting breeding property. If I move E around M, I will have a minus one bridge factor. Or if I exchange the positions of two epsilons, there's a minus one bridge factor. So this is a simple example of a topological order. But I want to consider general topological order. So what is the data describing a general topological order? 
And if you first specify the types of anions, say there's the trivial anion one, there's non-trivial anion A1, A2, and so on. I also need to describe the structure of the fusion, meaning when two anions come together, what kind of anions they become. There may be, uh, there's a summation of A3 here, so there may be multiple different A3s, and then for each A3, there may be multiple ways to fuse it into this A3. That's why this number N can be larger than one. And I also need to specify the, something like the statistics. Uh, the full structure of this topological order is kind of complicated. You can find the summary of that uh, in this paper, but if you just want to see a minimal physics-oriented introduction, you can do, look at this particular section of our paper. So, so far I haven't talked about symmetry. Now, with symmetries, topological orders are divided into different symmetry register topological orders, or SETs for short. Um, so to, to specify the data describing SET, I have to specify essentially uh, two pieces of data. First is how the symmetries permute the anions. For example, the symmetry can change, the E and I can exchange uh, E and M in the C2 topological order. Then after specifying that, I need to specify what kind of fractional quantum numbers those anions carry. For example, when there are SO3 spin rotational symmetry, E and M may carry some spin one half, but the local magnets will just carry integer spins. Again, uh, this structure is a bit complicated. If you want to see the full structure, you can look at this paper, or if you want to have some minimal physics oriented introduction, you can look at the other section of our paper. Or if you want to see an even more mathematical and an even more compact introduction compared to this paper, you can look at my other paper. So now, uh, again, I want to ask a similar question. I want to ask, what are the distinct symmetry reached the topological orders in those GUV symmetric lattice systems using the same uh, method? Uh, so I want to remark this method compared to the previous approaches have the following features compared to the previous part of field approach or the so-called G-cross the category theory approach. So this, this framework applies in principle, it applies to all SETs in all types of lattice systems. Uh, the pattern approach uh, usually is not that easy to apply to all, S, to, uh, all SETs. And uh, this framework can also distinguish different types of lattices with the same symmetry group. So the original G-cross the category theory only takes input of the symmetry group. It, it cannot distinguish, say, triangular lattices, particle lattice, carbon lattice. Now we can. Then uh, these are some results. So if I can apply this to the so-called U1 level 2N topological order, they are generalizations of the usual. Uh, they are just the lovely 1 level 2N states, but with those symmetries. Uh, so here you see, uh, I'm listing some uh, classes of lattices. Uh, each class actually represents an infinitely many types of lattices. Uh, for example, honeycomb lattice belongs to this type, triangular lattice belongs to this type, Kagami belongs to this type. And here, this is square lattice. Uh, this one is checkerboard lattice. And this afternoon, I became aware A plus B is called a lib lattice. Uh, sorry, A plus C is called a lib lattice. Uh, and uh, these are the number of states. You can also see the precise symmetry fractionization pattern of each case uh, from the paper. And there's some other results, uh, like for Z2, Z3, Z4 topological order and double semi and their generalizations. We also have those results. Uh, you can see the precise symmetry fractionization class of each state from this mathematical code. And then let, let me not bother you with the details. Let, let me just highlight one example. Uh, there's some uh, kind of uh, beyond part on Z2 is spinnacle. So uh, the lattice system I consider is just a square lattice such that at each side, I have a quantum established spin. The symmetry is this P4M symmetry, which is the lattice symmetry of square lattice, and chemical also symmetry. Previous part on based study of uh, such system found 64 states from this paper. For all those 64 states, the one of the, uh, bosonic anions E is a chroma stablet, the other is a chroma singlet. Furthermore, uh, this chroma singlet anion, it doesn't see any fractionalization that simultaneously involve lattice and translation symmetries. For example, uh, it doesn't see something like translation and time also do not commute. But we found another 53 states. Again, for those 53 states, E is a chroma stablet, M is a chroma singlet, but for all those cases, I always see some fractionalization simultaneously involving lattice and time symmetries. For example, translation may 
عند الكاميوت والكاميو بوصل انت مقعد على عكس ميري وين الكاميوت والكاميو بوصل اوكي سو انا بيسكن اللي انا اوت اوف تايم ذات مي سامرايز سو ذا تيك هوم مسج هي از ذات برو ذا اول ذا بيبول تو تيك ذا اكشلي اكزيست فور ذا بوصل Strictly speaking, we we can only say they are possible. We haven't constructed the models for them, but that's the next step. It could be some other constraints we haven't thought of. It's possible, but that would be very interesting. They are. You can check your time. Uh, so the take-home message is that if I want to check whether a quantum material can realize a quantum phase or phase transition, I can just check whether this anomaly matching condition holds. This is a very systematic way uh, to answer these questions, and it. Could answer many questions that couldn't be answered before, and we indeed found many previous and unexpected results. Uh, we applied it to stable liquids and uh, gap the spin liquids. Uh, it's the only available general framework for those states, and we found many uh, previous and unknown results. Uh, and as output, uh, because it's so important to know the anomaly, maybe it's useful to have a database of all anomalies of all systems. And as we are as one, what was asking, uh, we are just really, strictly speaking, we are suggesting their existence, and it's good to really realize them in models and the materials. And it would be interesting to apply this philosophy to other quantum physics Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so in the last example of the topological basis, uh, you're assuming that the IR conditions are only zero. Yeah. Okay. But so, 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 the UV symmetry is only zero. <laughs> so, you, I will add the IR symmetry. The IR symmetry is not zero. Yeah, so, <laughs> so were you looking at two form of morphism? I don't um, need to. Uh, but, so, you're looking at this form of morphism in the, the IR symmetry, right? Uh, I didn't do it in that way. I don't know how to do it in that way. But in this paper, we developed another way that directly calculates this pullback without knowing what we are. Meaning, would you like to know GIR? I know GIR. Uh, I kind of know GIR. I don't need to know GIR. Uh, this framework allows us to calculate the right hand side without knowing omega IR. Okay, so you don't need to know omega IR, you don't need to know GIR. Right. Well, I'm looking at the form of the one form symmetry. If you don't have it, then you can use symmetries which are zero form. Yeah, so generally you can have a zero form symmetry and the whole market between zero, the UV can go in that one form. Yeah, that's possible. That's just a symmetry representation. Well, that's an example, yeah. So, like, if you have a, yeah, you could have an emergent one form symmetry that has its own anomalies. Well, how can the zero for symmetry method the one? It's really the cohomology of the zero symmetry method. It's the cohomology. I'm not using that method. Well, I can give you a bunch of lattice and one question. And they have no solution right now. But certainly in the ground state, there's a bunch of additional hierarchy. In only interest in the UV symmetry. Uh -huh. No, I, I'm happy with that, but I thought the, in the rules of the game, it, I was under the impression that you need to know GUV and GIR, but you're starting with UV on you know, all different ones, like IR phases. So. Actually, for this case, we don't need that. Yeah, that's what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah. but for the, the the liquid, for the steep liquid example, you did need to know GIR. We did know it. I wouldn't say we didn't need to know it. Oh, you used it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Is it enough to know just the zero form part of JIR for the end of the That doesn't, that only includes the how cost which is permute the animals, not the symmetry perhaps Okay. Thank you. The zero form part of the JR is very limited. It's just a symmetry that can permit animals. Uh, why do you say that? Say I want to couple my topological order to a background 
zero from the H field and then symmetric fertilization for the benefit. Symmetric fertilization for the benefit. If n plus you are mixed by normally between zero and one percent. Essentially, maybe that's the way of thinking about it. But I don't think you need that way. Uh -huh. uh, for example, for the C2 topological order, GIR, the zero form part is just uh, this annual permutation symmetry. In fact, if I really talk about GIR, it doesn't make sense to say, for example, SO3 is part of the GIR. Well, if your E particle, say, carries. In one part of the SO3, right? Then the partition function of your theory in the presence of an SO3 pH field will, you know, will be sensitive. Yes, yes. But uh, it's possible that we're not talking about this, not using the same convention. Uh, in the convention I'm trying to use, uh, that's not a zero from part of the GR. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, I don't know how to reproduce our results by using the two group. Yeah, there's some stuff in the very trying how to think of this stuff for two group. But yeah, yeah. For, for, for special cases, uh, it has been worked out, but I don't know if it's been done in such a way. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have this kind of structure of the, the I would expect so, but if you have spin the if you have spin the company, uh, it's more complicated. But I have more or less know what to do it. There are no surprises. Uh, yeah, maybe conceptually there wouldn't be a lot of stresses in high dimensions, but in mean, technically there are many details. Do you expect that there is some way to generalize this to filling constraints once you allow for electron freedom? There must be a way, uh, but I don't know it precisely yet. I think the paper by Martin Sabbath and the motion is a paper. Martin Sabbath, the motion. What else am I going with? We discussed it in the paper. Speaking of long term, we'll all speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m. So feel free to stop by again. You're welcome. Man. You should be here. So, any more questions, comments? That's cool. Okay, please. No. That's thanks, Dilgen. Thank you.